Good morning and welcome to today's 20-minute update, BCF's monthly series of interactive calls and Facebook live streams to give you an inside look at BCF, our initiatives, and the work we do here in Baltimore City, Baltimore County, and the entire region. Thanks for joining us today. My name is Andrew Waldman with BCF and joining me today are Tafadzwa Gutierrez and Eric Norton. <clears throat> Tafadzwa is also, we're going to call her Taffy throughout this call. She's a transportation advocate. Eric is our Director of Policy and Programs at the Transportation Alliance, and they're both members of the Get Maryland Moving Coalition, which we'll talk about a little bit more as the call goes on. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Thanks, Thanks, for Thanks for being here. Thanks for having us. Um, before I get started, I just want to say a quick shout out to the Civic Leadership Fund donors who make this call possible. It's because of those donors that we're able to do the 20 minute update and a lot of other things here at BCF. So thank you. Okay, today we're talking about transportation and specifically uh, the regional transit plan for Central Maryland. And just before the call, I found out that this is going to be called Connecting Our Future. That's what MTA is calling it. So we're talking about the regional transit plan, Connecting Our Future. Um, so let's jump right into it. I wonder, Eric, if you could give me just an overview of what and how this transit plan is coming together, what the history is, those sure. sort of background pieces. Sure. Um, so there's nothing particularly new about regional transit plans or city transit plans. These happen all the time um, in cities all over the country and regions all over the country. Um, and we've had transit plans in Baltimore um, dating back to 1968 is the first one I'm aware of, where there was a regional vision for uh, rapid transit throughout uh, the greater Baltimore region. Uh, our most recent version of that was the 2002 Regional Rail Plan, and that is where the Baltimore Red Line came from. Uh, there's a, a, a map you can put up on the screen, hopefully. Um, after the Red Line was, was canceled in 2015, there was a feeling among some advocates that we didn't have a, a vision or a plan anymore. That, that felt sort of like defunct and dated. It's been almost 20 years. So last year, uh, kind of from that feeling, the General Assembly passed and the governor signed a, a new law that directed MTA to create and deliver a new Central Maryland Regional Transit Plan. And that plan is due by October 2020. So just this month, uh, as you mentioned, you learned it's called Connecting Our Future. Just this month, the MTA kicked off this effort by launching a, a new website, and we can put that up later. Uh, and we anticipate some public engagement events and meetings over the next couple months as they, as they get this underway. So that's sort of the, the genesis of where this idea comes from. Um, great. Um, <clears throat> so you, you talked a little bit about the previous plans and what those did and did not do. What types of problems or problems are we trying to solve with this new plan? Mm -hmm. So the Transportation Alliance cares about transportation for all sorts of reasons, economic, environmental, social, financial. But one thing that always rises to the top for us is access to jobs and access to opportunity. And um, there are studies done in the region that show that um, if you have access to a car in the Baltimore region, you can get to any job you want in 60 minutes or less. 100% of the jobs are, are available to you, essentially. But if you're relying on transit, then only 9% of the jobs uh, are reachable in um, 60 minutes or less. So essentially, if you're relying on, on transit, nine out of 10 jobs are out of reach or an extremely long commute. And we've essentially built a region where it's practically a requirement to own a car just to participate in the economy. And that's a hefty cost. Car, owning a car costs about $9,000 a year. So especially for lower middle income families, that's, that's a heavy burden. Um, and the impact isn't just on household budgets, it's, it also affects entire neighborhoods. Um, recently, a, a few years ago now, I guess, um, there was a study that found that children born in Baltimore face the longest odds of escaping poverty of any big um, county in the, in the country. And transportation and commute times they found was a critical factor uh, affecting those odds. And locally here, the Baltimore Neighborhood Indicators Alliance has found that neighborhoods with a high percent of workers who have long commute times, 45 minutes or more, uh, those are the neighborhoods that are suffering the most from high unemployment mm -hmm. and population loss. So if we, if we want to help those neighborhoods, we need to better connect them to jobs and opportunities. And a regional transit plan could be used, could be focused on addressing those issues and connecting people to jobs and lowering those commute times. It's great. Uh, Taffy, I wanted to bring you in here. <clears throat> you um, 
obviously your your position in community kind of gives you perspective on how these things how the lack of planning or how our transit system is affecting people on the ground. I wonder if you could characterize that at all for, for the audience. Okay, so for a lot of people who have children, it it's multiple buses in the morning for them to get to school. It's multiple buses for them to get to work. I know because this morning I had to take three buses to get out here from West Baltimore County. So it was bus number 37, the subway, and instead of catching a third bus, I decided to walk it from State Center. And so that's the commute for many people. Uh, if you're working in the city to move from east to west, it's still multiple buses. It can take you at least an hour, if not more, sometimes an hour and a half, to get from one end of the city to the other end of the city. So if you think, if you factor in doctor's appointments, grocery stores, anything to give you a good standard of living, it affects you in some shape or form. Wow. Um, thank you for that. I'm, so we kind of set up the problem. What is this plan? Um, what is sort of the success, what does a, a successful plan look like? I mean, what do you imagine the end result of this process being? Either of you or both. I guess, sorry, <laughs> you want to start? Uh, I will start. Okay. I, for me, it, in, it involves um, access to job centers and access to places, to amenities for everyone, not only people who live in suburbia, but people who live in the city. It includes uh, safe transportation because a lot of the times we don't have enough security on the buses. We don't have enough security for our kids. It includes lighted bus stops. It includes buses that operate on time and cleanliness. Um, all of those things are included in, in that picture for me. Yeah, I'd say for us, you know, a good plan should have some clearly defined goals. They, there should be metrics for how to measure whether we're achieving those goals. Uh, timeline for implementing, you know, when we're going to achieve certain milestones, you know, all the, this kind of high level stuff, but all those things, you know, should be in a good plan so that it's not just something that's a plan on paper, but it's something that is implementable, you know, over a amount of time um, and something that you can also, you know, revisit and update mm -hmm. on, a, on a regular basis. Um, I think those are some things we'd like to see in there. Um, you know, a good plan, what it should give us, um, right now, when we look at the state's um, capital transportation budget, we see, you know, in the future, programmed cuts to the Maryland Transit Administration's budget, um, you know, over 50% over the course of, like, six years. And when we see the list of projects that's in that capital program, there are no projects, new projects, in the pipeline for the Baltimore region. There's, you know, maintenance stuff, state of good repair, mm -hmm. new subway cars, revamping the light rail vehicles, things like that that are great, track maintenance, all stuff we need to do. But there's no new projects, there's no new capacity that's in the pipeline. So ideally, a good plan will give us those, you know, projects we can point to to say, this is what you're gonna do next, and we can get those things, you know, into the planning phase, into development, and then into construction. Um, so I think those are some things we'd like to see, see from a good plan. And, for Get Maryland Moving, um, that's still in its early stages, but they have they have set out or are working on um, some sort of um, criteria that they think a plan should address. Um, so if you we can get people connected to Get Maryland Moving, sort of towards the end of the call, and they can check those out. Yeah, yeah. definitely. I, I want to ask a couple questions about Get Maryland Moving as well. Um, so one thing that just occurred to me, and actually we just have we just got our first question. So. I'm just going to pause real quick and say, if you have a question and are listening on the phone, you want to hit star six on your keypad to unmute yourself, and then you can ask your question. If you are following along on our Facebook live stream, you can just type the question right into the comment section and we'll address it. So if, you have a, if you're on the call right now, um, go ahead and hit star six to unmute yourself and ask your question. Okay, nothing on the phone. We do have our first Facebook question, um, and this actually was leading right into my next question anyway. So um, I'm going to sort of double barrel this. First of all, I want you to tell me a little bit more about the plan commission and who is sitting on that. Okay. Um, and then I'm going to get to this question. So can you tell me who exactly is involved in making this plan happen? Sure. Um, so the, the plan itself, the way the law is written, will be written and created by the Maryland Transit Administration which is under the Maryland Department of Transportation, which is you know, run by the governor. So it's, it's the executive branch of the, of the state that'll be actually writing the plan.
but um, also in the law is a Central Maryland Regional Transit Plan Commission that is sort of going to be advising MTA as, as they go through the process. And they have um, two specific roles that are laid out in the law, which is focusing on public participation and making sure that's meaningful and setting the goals. Mm -hmm. And so the members of that commission, there's 11 members of that commission, and it's made up of the mayor um, or the mayor's designee or the county executives of the surrounding counties that are part of this um, region, which is Anne Arundel, Howard, Hartford, and Baltimore County. They either, their county executive or a designee, and then the governor gets to choose a few people, and the House speaker and the Senate president get a couple of picks. So those are the 11 members of the commission, um, and that's sort of what they're focused on. So high level, not actually writing the plan, but sort of advising MTA. Okay, this, that, thank you for that. This, this question, We'll expand on that. Um, the question is, how do we ensure the voices of actual transit riders aren't overpowered by the people who claim to be advocates, form work groups, host meetings, but don't actually use our transit system every day? That's a that's, pretty pointed question. That's a great question. I don't know, Taffy, if you it's, 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 a, it's a really good <laughs> question, and it's a difficult one to answer. The one thing I would say is that on the commission, there's someone from who's supposed to be a designate of like actual transit riders. That person will probably come from um, the Citizens Advisory Council of MTA. But I will say though, there'll be plenty of opportunity for public meetings. And one of the things I've learned over many years of doing public engagement and trying to bring people to meetings and teach them stuff is that people have to show up. People have to fill the room on those meetings because if the public has the visual of being engaged with this plan, then MTA has to respond. Uh, one of the things I would say is that if you, and I know people have busy schedules, but I would say is try to attend as many meetings as you can and trying to uh, trying to spread the message of these meetings to as many members and community as possible so that people can fill the room and hold MTA accountable. And to piggyback off that a little bit, there's, so there's the official way people can get involved, like mm -hmm. yeah, fill in rooms, you know, come into those public outreach meetings that MTA is going to hold, come into the commission meetings that, that they're going to have to hold. I assume will be public, but then, you know, from the outside, that's what Get Maryland Moving wants to work right. on, is sort of playing the outside game, advocating for people, for riders, uh, for the general public to to make the plan the best it can be. So hopefully, you know, those folks who want to get engaged that way will learn more about Get Maryland Moving, get involved with us, you know, and, and help us as we try to advocate from the outside. Yeah, why don't you um, describe a little bit more about what Get Maryland Moving is so our um, our listeners and uh, viewers can, you know, have a little bit more context. Do you want to do that mm -hmm. one? You can, and I can, I can fill in the gaps okay, sure. that you have. <laughs> so Get Maryland Moving, so that's a, a broader-based coalition that um, the Central Maryland Transportation Alliance is, is a member of, and Ooh. that group um, has formed sort of formed and reformed a few times throughout its history. It was instrumental back in 2013 in increasing the gas tax. Um, it was instrumental a couple years ago in repealing this thing called the fare box recovery mandate, which is kind of a wonky thing, but essentially it was, um, it was a requirement in the law that really held back some investments that MTA could make. So Get Maryland Movie wanted to get that out of the way, sort of clear a hurdle. Uh, so that was good. Um, so now it's reforming to address this regional transit plan, try to hold MTA's feet to the fire, try to make it sort of the best plan it can be. And it's broad-based um, coalition. Still, we're still gathering members. We hope to, you know, be, I think, you know, 25, 50 members if we can get up to it. Um, right now, it includes um, folks like the Transportation Alliance, um, business organizations, labor, other advocacy groups, um, riders. So we're trying to sort of make it as big and broad as possible. Employers, anyone that cares about transit and wants this plan to be good is is more than welcome. Did I miss something, Daphne? No, I think you covered everything. And I think it's important to know that uh, one of the things of Get Maryland Moving is that it's a broad coalition. So it's not only one group of people, it's everyone. And the reason why it's everyone is because the wins cannot occur if it's only one group of people. And so we recognize that business owners have to be there, um, people who are advocates, people who are in the nonprofit sector, labor organizations, whoever you are, if you believe that we deserve better transit in the Baltimore region, then you ought to be a part of Get Maryland Moving. Great. Um, this question just occurred to me if, when I was looking at the map that the MTA um, had put up earlier with their new website, um, that it includes 
Harford County. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking about how different the challenges are regarding transportation and transit are in Harford County as they are, say, in West Baltimore County. Um, yes. And how do you balance... I mean, I, I, I don't think there's anyone from Harford County and Get Maryland Moving, is there, in the coalition? Yeah. Um, but how do you balance those um, very different, uh, uh, you know, the very different requirements that people have for transportation, say, here and way out there? Mm -hmm. It's something like a, a regional transit plan that includes so many different um, people. Mm -hmm. So my answer to that is something, because this is a question that comes up in many other groups that I'm part of all the time. And one of the things I would say is that we start off with good listening. And then we talk about the one thing that we can all, or the two or three things that we can all agree on. One is access to opportunity. There are many families in Hartford County who won't have access to good jobs, who may be, and there are many families in the rest of the surrounding regions, like in Baltimore County, Baltimore City, Howard, and Arundel, who maybe want to have access to those good jobs in Hartford County. So by, in Aberdeen. And they have no way of getting there. And so we can all agree that families and, and individuals as a whole want access to opportunity. And so the way to do it is to have a centralized plan that gives everyone access to opportunity. Great. Um, we have another question here. Um, this also came from Facebook. Okay, this is a very specific question. I'll ask it, and if we can't answer it, we can, um, we can get back to this, uh, to this person. Why are the MTA buses so empty during the day, <clears throat> and other times during other than time other times during rush hour? Why are they empty during the day and times other than rush hour? Any chance of much smaller vehicles that run on more practical routes? Any uh, way that they cannot disrupt the flow of traffic as much as the larger buses? Those are very specific mm. questions. I don't know. Are those the types of questions that would be part of a plan like this? I mean. I don't, would those be, are those a little too specific? I think they might be a little too specific. Yeah, they might be a little specific to MTA. I'd also say, you know, I think the, um, I'm, I'm seeing an empty bus thing um, is some, a common refrain we hear. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the reasons for that is it, it, it doesn't make any sense to, for a transit agency to try and um, have a bus that fits um, you know, a specific time of day, you're trying to have a bus that sort of maximizes your use for, you know, your peak period. Right. Um, so, you know, yes, it's not going to be full 100% of the time, but our roads aren't full 100% of the time either. Um, but we don't say, why is this road so wide right here? You know, this should be more narrow in the middle of the day. Like, you know, that's Can't sort roll of... that up in the middle of the day. <laughs> right. Sure, it's, yeah. It doesn't really make sense. That's kind of not how transportation works. Um, you know, it also, it doesn't make sense. You're trying to find a happy meal. It doesn't make sense to have, you know, 80 foot articulated buses on everything too because you don't need that so you're trying to sort of balance that like what's the biggest bus i need but not too big um so i i, I think that addresses that as far as um you know ideally you know having um i think they mentioned more logical um, routes or something um yeah. ideally you know routing you know choosing corridors to invest in hopefully that will be part of the plan um you know finding those corridors where um you can best connect people, where people live, to where people are working, and finding the right investments, you know, whatever mode it is, um, whatever you need to do, whether it's a bus only lane, um, or transit signal priority, or just more service in general, you know, whatever that intervention is, um, ideally they would identify that. And there might be, you know, areas where at the end of uh, transit, line a high capacity line like you know the subway or something like that at the end of owings mills there's a small circulator type bus mm -hmm. so you know those smaller vehicles they could be part of the mix um but they'd probably be sort of unique circumstances okay um we have a couple more questions coming in from facebook uh this actually was asked by uh, a person who i have this question sort of on my list so this is perfect um how will this planning process be different than previous ones mm -hmm. Uh, there are great plans that have been created, including those looking at how to link together existing bus, light rail, metro, etc., but lack the funding and political will and have resulted in little action. So we have a lot of, and we were talking about this before the mm -hmm. call, there's lots of boards and committees and these things exist. What makes this any better or, you know, is it the same thing? 
repackage. Okay, so <laughs> I cannot speak to political will, but I will say that the public has a has a vo voting voice, so use your voice wisely. Um, I will speak towards funding and say that MTA is funded by the state of Maryland, and so you have to press your legislators, you have to press your mayor, you have to press the county execs um, to focus on making transit a priority so that more money can come out of Annapolis for the MTA. So that's the, uh, my answer to that question. But the third answer would be that we have a regional transportation board called the Baltimore Regional Transportation Board, um, and they do regional planning for transportation, but they don't have a focus on transit. And this plan has a specific focus on transit. So it's a unique opportunity. Okay, good. Just to add something to that, to, yeah, there have been plans in the past and, and what's come of them, you know, um, has it has it been enough? Have we implemented enough of previous plans? And I think ideally what we can get out of this new plan is if we get more people engaged on the ground, if we get local governments to buy into it and support it and fight for, you know, whatever comes out of it, whatever investments that, that we want, yeah, county executives and the mayor to go to Annapolis and say, hey, this is what I want done, you know, we have an opportunity here to make that happen. I, I think you, know, you might be able to criticize previous plans for sort of being written up by, you know, a blue ribbon commission or something, and maybe the public involvement and engagement wasn't there from the beginning that got people to really own the plan and feel like it was theirs and they wanted it to happen. So, you know, I think it's on us as, as advocates to, to try and make that happen and get get local governments to buy into it, get people to support it, um, and really engage on this. Um, I think you just answered one of our last questions here, which was, can we expect to see more involvement from those not Baltimore City jurisdictions in this plan? Hopefully. I, I hope so. <laughs> I think so. I think they're ready. I think they've been looking for an avenue to be get more involved, and I think maybe Get Maryland Moving is that avenue. Okay, good. Um, we're almost out of time. There's one other question, which I'm not sure it, it was about maglev. And that's more of an intercity thing. I don't think it's part of this plan necessarily, right? And I people don't, who don't know, maglev is a proposed intercity train high speed rail line uh, that people have been talking about. I don't. Yeah, I don't think that would fall into this. This is, yeah, a little more, you know, regional transit. That's probably yeah, sort of like interregional. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right, so we're a little bit over time. We had a lot of questions. Um, we did talk about Get Maryland Moving, but I want to give Eric a chance to plug this stuff. So sure. if you could tell us where people can find information yeah. about Get Maryland Moving. So as I said, we're still um, uh, we're still forming, <laughs> still early. But So we don't have a, a website yet, but we do have Facebook. Um, so that's at Get MD Moving. And we have a Twitter, which is at Get MD Moving Now. Um, so you can check out those, um, follow us there, um, so we can get updates in the coming weeks. And ideally, we'll we'll launch a website and get a, you know, e email list going. All those things. And then I also want to direct people to, if they want to learn more about this and get engaged, the MTA's website about this plan um, recently launched, and that's rtp.mta.maryland.gov. And you can sign up there to receive alerts, go to check out a broad overview of the plan, and then keep up to date when they start doing the public outreach. And we'll uh, we'll put all this in the comments section of our Facebook live stream. So if you're if you're on the phone and you want to check out our Facebook, go ahead and uh, get online facebook.com slash Baltimore CF. You can find all that information there. Um, OK, so it's it's past time now. I just want to thank you both for being here. This, this has been a very enlightening call, um, and I hope that the information was useful to advocates that are listening in on the call as well. Um, once again, thanks to our civic leadership donors for making this call possible. We'll be back next month on February 21st, and we'll be talking about Judy Center research. So once again, thanks for tuning in, and have a good new year. Thanks, Thank you.